So yeah. the government and the media paint the organization as this really sophisticated criminal structure with precise uh, orders, right? Uh, like drug trafficking, you know, but in your estimation, are there any official orders from the top, like in a chapter, for example, that's that sit down and say, okay, what do you, what are you guys into? The way the mob sits down and says, okay, you're into a sports book or loan sharking right. or, or extortion. No, that that's not happening in the hell's angels. Okay. And you know, there are particular individuals that involve themselves. I'll give you a, a perfect example. Example. There was a, a crew of guys up in the Bay area, uh, Kenny Owens, uh, Chico, uh, I can't think of his, we used to call him Chico Minestrone. He was an Italian guy, and that was his kind of nickname. Uh, uh, Jim Jim Brandis. I don't know if you ever heard of Jim Jim Brandis. Mm -hmm. Really, Jim Jim. really ruthless guy. And uh, those were the guys that controlled the meth market. Mm. Probably for, uh, you know, a good percentage in the United States, right. you know. And uh, they all got busted in the late 80s, you know. Uh, Chico went, got 40 years. Kenny got 41 years. Uh, uh, during that particular investigation, uh, Sonny got caught up in uh, giving uh, the informant permission to blow some guys up. You know, they had come mm -hmm. to me initially and said, I was the West Coast chairman at the time, uh, which was a job that really didn't have any official uh, authority. But as I stated earlier, what I found out almost immediately is you have this de facto, uh, uh, you know, position yeah. as a leader. People go, well, he's the West Coast chairman. He's, you know, right. he's got to have some power. And so they approached you like for permission to, to bo go blow these guys up in uh, uh, Kentucky. And it's not because I have, you know, such a high m moral values. Uh, uh, my red flags went up and my first thought was this guy is asking me permission to go mm -hmm. blow these guys up that were fighting. You know, he wanted to blow up the outlaws. Uh, uh, and, you know, my first thought was, you don't need my permission. We're right. fighting with these guys already. But when you say, okay, like I push back when I hear you say it's a totally decentralized thing. It's, right. it's not a criminal organization. Just right. some members, half of them at right. least happen to be criminals. But right. then you say, well, we're fighting with a rival Biker gang. Well, yeah, but what does fighting entail? It's well, not on Twitter. Well, but, you, you know, know, this is the thing. You didn't ask me what we were fighting about. And what are you fighting about? And how is okay. how does that fighting occur? And what is what is the fighting? Well, is the it, fighting's serious. I mean, people dying. Uh, right. Which and, is criminal. Well, so Well, I see it. To me, I see that more as an outlaw type. Uh, uh, in, you know, some people may go, oh, he's a hypocrite. You know? Outlaw. Law. Yeah, yeah, outside, outside the law. Uh, sure. And I consider myself someone that lived outside the law for all those years. Do I live outside the law now? Not really, you know. I don't do anything illegal. Uh, you know, I speed on my motorcycle. Mm. Uh, I just, you know, came back from Pismo Beach Sunday, you know, probably 80 miles an hour all the way, uh, pulling a sidecar, you know, with my yeah. wife and my dog in it. How many times would people approach you uh, about, Criminal activity, yeah, committing constantly. murder constantly, constantly. You know? Yeah, I mean, I have people come and try to uh, uh, hire the club to go kill their partner uh, oh, uh, because wow. they got to, you know, uh, run a beef with the guy. Wow. And uh, so, what you do you know, do as you want to? If you want to keep the club clean, what 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 what's your first reaction when well, you're approached about murder? Do you say, "Hey, no, you shouldn't do that," or do you say? <laughs> Or do you? Or do you think, God, this guy's maybe wearing a wire? Well, that's like, the first thing I think. You have that's to, what right? I'm laughing. I'm going, you know. So they come into me and they say, Hey, you know, uh, we uh, are having a dispute at our business. I want to get rid of my partner. Uh, make it worth your wild. And, you know, first thing I tell them is, you know, buy the guy out. <laughs> you know, because I'm I know they're recording me. At least yeah. if they're not, I'm thinking they are. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I lost count of how many times that happened. We had a guy walk into the clubhouse. This is the late 70s. And he must have put $10,000 of $100 bills on the table. And he wanted to hire us. And I, I'm being honest. I don't remember why he wanted to hire us. Yeah. But 
I didn't want that money. And, you know, I've got my vice president there. And he's salivating yeah. at these $100 bills on this yeah. table. And, I, you know, I pushed the, everything back to the guy. And there's no doubt in my mind that, you know, we were being recorded. Yeah. I don't think we were being filmed. They weren't that sophisticated back then. Right. But there's no doubt in my mind, you know, yeah. we weren't being recorded and never heard from the guy again. Right. Know? But <clears throat> just from your fearsome look and your reputation, people think, oh, these guys are killers. Yeah. And, you know, some of it's earned, you know. Uh, yeah. I mean, there's guys in prison, uh, you know, for shooting people. But, uh, but you you don't think club presidents, or at least at least your chapter or chapters of California, sanction murders by their, no. by their ranking no, members. No, but you know, you, you get a lot of inner conflicts, you know, the, you go back to the seventies, Terry the Tramp, uh, probably 70 or so. I can't remember the date, 70 or 71 mm -hmm. hot shot, you know? Yeah. You know, he was given a hot shot. They wanted to get rid of him. A hot shot, a heroin. Heroin hot uh -huh. shot. Uh, and then you've got, you know, Harry the Horse, Gary Robles. Uh, you know, you've got all these these murder snake uh, that they're still, you know, unresolved. You know, they're, yeah. they're cold cases now, I guess you'd call them. Yeah, the, the government, here's the thing about, you know, outlaw clubs, biker clubs. They're kind of like cults. The Branch Davidians come to mind, right? Yeah, they're, see, but I, I don't like that terminology because I, I don't feel we were— well, well, Colt, we were a club. You know? Sure. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm I'm just talking about the way in which the government investigates you guys seemingly with no evidence, seemingly... Uh, well, they create the evidence sometimes. Right. And I think probably just like everything in life, the truth is somewhere in the middle. Uh, but certainly the government in the small town of Ventura, California, spent decades and resources trying to take you down. They wanted you gone. Well, I was told they spent over $30 million just in the uh, 2001 case where we, we were indicted. Uh, the investigation started in 1970, excuse me, 1999, I believe, or 98. It had to do with the 50, 50th Hells Angel anniversary. And what transpired was and this is law enforcement's, enforcement's imagination. They thought Sonny went to Arizona, retired, and that I had taken over the club. And, you know, I was confronted by law enforcement. I told them, I go, you know, that's not how our club is structured. But uh, uh, regardless of what I said, they, they didn't believe it. Mm. They got money from the government. Uh, they got grants. Uh, they took money uh, uh, from within the community. Uh, they admitted... Uh, you know, the district attorney Bradbury admitted that they spent ten million dollars. I was told by someone in law enforcement that I was friends with uh, they spent thirty million dollars, and you know they got. Uh, I pled guilty to uh, uh, some sort of tax charge. I mean, they're so yeah. you know people laugh. I have people write me and they go, "What did you get busted for?" And I go, "I don't remember," and they think I'm lying. Yeah, but you know. You get one felony. Yeah, I mean, sure. What, what does it matter? You know, right. you're a felon. You know. Um, yeah, <clears throat> you certainly, uh, according to your Wikipedia page, you certainly were the de facto mayor, governor of Ventura. Do you think it's the nature of these small towns that allow large biker gangs to thrive? Because it's not like being in New York City where there's so much law enforcement right. everywhere. They could, these are kind of more remote places that kind of lend themselves to a more outlaw way of life. Well, well, you know, I would take exception with the term gang. We always consider ourselves a club, but... Okay, sorry. No, it's okay. <laughs> you don't have to apologize. Uh, I've been called worse things. Uh, but, you know, look, I've read that in web Wikipedia, and uh, somebody, you know, wrote, wrote me and said, you got to read what they're saying about you, yeah. you know? And... It was saying all the small time drug dealers they arrested in Ventura would say, yeah, we're getting all of our meth and marijuana from the Hells Angels, but we're not giving you any names because we're well, scared. We control that town. Uh, right. And I ran that town with an iron fist. Uh, you know, what you have to understand is I had a concert promotion business. I had a T-shirt business. I had the only tattoo shop in town for 35 mm -hmm. years. I had a bail bonds business. 
and I was the uh, administrator for my daughter's law office. So, you know, I was quite the entrepreneur at mm. that time. I mean, I didn't have time to uh, sling illegal drugs. And, you know, I kind of stepped away from that that whole uh, uh, lifestyle in the 80s. You Did know? you have a background in that? Well, I mean, you don't become leader of the Hells Angels without understanding what the hell's going on in the streets. You know, I'm just being candid with you. Uh, uh, I think also uh, it didn't interest me because... Easier ways to make money. You get busted one time and you go, uh, time you bail out and all the money you spend on uh, your lawyer and uh, what they uh, take from you and don't give you back. Uh, it just didn't seem worth it to me. So there's no incentive for uh, somebody in the Yeah, club. a lot of people have an, an incentive, you know, and I'm sure there's still people out there slinging, but it, it just... You know, it just seems like a different world. But, you know, I'm almost 80 years old now. I, uh, I have different values. I have different uh, things that drive me. Uh, you know, when you're a young man uh, and you're in a strong, powerful leadership position, you have a different philosophy. You know, like we were talking earlier off camera, uh, you know, I was always known as a peacemaker. Mm. But like I told you, you know, to be an effective peacemaker, you have to be willing to go to war. So... You know, did okay. I get my hands dirty? Yeah. So, you know, so let's talk about going to war. In the 70s, I think it was 77, there were a series of bombings that took place. In Los Angeles. Yeah. yeah. Can you tell us about those? Sure, yeah. There was a, uh, a conflict between the Los Angeles, Hells Angels, San Diego Hells Angels, uh, and a white club called the Mongols, mm -hmm. uh, which were kind of a fledgling bike club at the time. Yeah. And uh, actually now they're very powerful. Sure. And uh, a real force to be reckoned with. But there's always been problems between those Always two. been problems, and I believe yeah. there always will be problems. And what you have to understand is, you know, cops think it's over drugs and it's this and it's that. It's not. You know, like I stated earlier, and we kind of got off subject uh, about the outlaws, how that war started. And this war kind of started perhaps in the same way. We had a Hells Angel that testified against other Hells Angels in uh, Richmond, California. He came down, went to Long Beach, and uh, became a Mongol. And, you know, the other guys went to the Witness Protection Program. You know, he, he was hiding in plain sight. Wow. And <clears throat> the Mongols were new uh, to that lifestyle, and... Perhaps they didn't understand the, you know, the gravity of uh, what he had done. And I'm sure he lied uh, uh, to everybody because later Harry Bowman, head of the uh, uh, Outlaws, and I got in a big conversation about it, uh, uh, that this guy Chester was, you know, a, an informant. You know, he had testified against the Hells Angels. He didn't believe it. This guy convinced him that he hadn't. I had to show him the actual paperwork. Uh, hey, this is what the guy did. But... That was the first factor. Then you had uh, a ex Hell's Angels wife living with a Mongol, uh, and then the Mongols. Uh, I don't know where they came up with this idea, but they thought we're going to put on a California rocker. And at that time, the Hell's Angels were the only uh, organization in California that had the full California rocker. And that's and the the patch, the patch along on the, the bottom, bottom, the bottom of the rocker. Vest. Yeah, right. and the, the, the Mongols, is, I believe, is straight. Ours was uh, curved. Okay. You know, that's why I refer to it as a rocker. And they put that on there. We had warned them not to do it, but they put that on there. And the last holiday, uh, uh, September, I forget the dates, 1977, uh, uh, Jingles and Redbeard, uh, two Mongols from San Diego, got shot off their bikes. And from there, uh, the next uh, uh, provocation was at the double funeral, uh, a bomb went off uh, at the funeral. And uh, a couple of weeks later— the people uh, get killed in that No, bombing? they were injured but not killed. A couple of weeks later, a uh, bomb went off at the frame-up uh, motorcycle shop. And, uh, you know, Mongol died and his 15-year-old cousin uh, standing alongside of him. And then there were, you know, several bombings uh, throughout uh, San Fernando Valley, Los Angeles, uh, car bombings. You know, nobody else died. But, uh, you know, you had 
five people killed in a matter of just a few weeks. You know, did you have anything to do with those bombings? Of course not. You know, I uh, actually uh, was against the bombings. Did you know uh, about them? Though I did, did you, know about them. You, did I, you know they were going to happen? I'm, well, I suspected something was going to happen yeah. because they had put a bomb. What happened was I walked into a uh, middle of a meeting, an impromptu type meeting. At, after about sixty seconds, I realized they were conspiring to build a bomb and to go bomb this uh, Mongol uh, facility or. You know, it wasn't a really a clubhouse. It was more of a business, mm -hmm. but it was a hangout kind of yeah. a place. I don't know if they're making a lot of money. And I, you know, had come out of the military, Marine Corps, yeah. worked for the Department of Defense, you know. Right. And I said, you know, you guys are going to bomb this place? I go, what about collateral damage? And they were very cavalier. And I said, well, I'm out of here. I got up and I left. And uh, they did take a bomb there. It didn't go off. And old man John, who was the president of Los Angeles, made me uh, go back and retrieve the bomb that didn't go off because there were people mad at me because I walked out of the meeting and said I wasn't going to participate. And how did these other members who did participate, how did they know how to build a bomb? Was there past military experience as well? That I, that I can't answer, okay. honestly. Uh, the Vietnam, guy, they might have yeah, had. The guy that made the bomb, Brett Eaton, wound up ratting on everybody. You know. So people went down for those bombings. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We had a Ventura member. The, he's the guy that, well, he was a Los Angeles member, later became a Ventura member. He had taken the bomb into the uh, Mongol shop, and he did. He wound up doing uh, some time over it, now, but not he, for till 10 years <laughs> later. Okay. Now, you as a chapter president, could you hear about this conspiracy to set off all these bombs, do you would you actually have the authority to say you can't do this? Well, or does everybody kind of operate autonomously? Uh, people are, are working autonomously, but you have to understand that, uh, you know, people don't want to get involved in that stuff, you know? I mean... No, yes, they do. Well, <laughs> they not <were> me. <laughs> not me, but I'm saying that you, you're talking about membership, Across California, you know, you in the conspiracies that uh, came from these uh, uh, violent acts in San Diego, for like Redbeard and Jingle, I think there were two people involved uh, in the conspiracy. One guy went to prison. Uh, the other guy became an informant, uh, Brad Eaton. Same thing in the bombing. You had uh, Brad Eaton and this guy build the bomb. Brad Eaton ratted on him. You know, he went mm -hmm. to prison. So, you know, it was adjudicated. And obviously, if they could have arrested everybody in Los Angeles, they would have. Mm -hmm. They didn't have the evidence. And uh, that's not the way the crime came down. Right. Right. Okay. So it's it's conspiracies. It's criminals or people that are committing criminal acts inside of a larger organization, but kept within their own... Uh, you know, little world within that organization. Well, you know, in other words, somebody can go, two members of the Hells Angels can go blow up a Mongol without uh, like a vote, like the way the mafia has like a council and they have to get permission to go pull a yeah, hit. Yeah, people were just running amok. This I is the see. 70s. You right. know, people were just running amok. Of course. Now, as things progressed in the late 80s, you know, I came, I went into prison, came back, uh, and I had a lot more uh, gravitas, if you will, you know, it, interesting enough, you know, yeah. you, you're, you know how it is on the street. You know, you go to prison, it gives you some, uh, give you street cred. Some juice. Yeah. And I came back and uh, I was being very vocal about ending all these wars. We were fighting the Mongols. We were fighting the outlaws. We were on and off with the banditos. We were fighting the pagans. And uh, ultimately, we'd wind up fighting the Vagos, uh, but that wouldn't be, you know, for 20, 25 years later. So I wanted to end all these uh, uh, conflicts. And uh, how I really started doing it is I used jail as a, uh, a platform uh, to, you know, petition people. In jail, outlaw bike clubs don't fight. Mm. You could be in there with a Mongol who you're fighting with on the right. street. You could be in there with an outlaw who you're fighting with on the street, a pagan, a bandito, a vago, but you don't fight with them in jail, mm. you know, and you share the yard with yeah. them. And uh, 
that was when I came back and proposed to everybody. I go, why are we fighting on the street when we're not fighting in prison? I go, mm -hmm. we've got everything we want here on the street. We've got, you know, everything you can imagine. What What, what is some of that? Well, you know, uh, motorcycles, brotherhood, uh, women, drugs, money, you know, power, mm -hmm. prestige. You mm -hmm. know, a lot of people might, you know, laugh uh, and go, oh, you know, who wants to be part of an outlaw motorcycle club? But, you know, it gives you a lot of street cred. Yeah. And uh, uh, it's almost like you put that patch on your back, whatever patch it may be. It's like a carte blanche. Mm -hmm. You know, you can get away with a lot of stuff. And you have to be very careful uh, as you vet the people that come around the club that they're not going to uh, just, you know, become out of control make a mockery of the, the yeah patch. i mean you know well i was gonna ask you that so uh because i couldn't really get it out of jay dobbins when uh, i asked him about how he was able to infiltrate the club uh down in i think it was arizona but when you're we've got a prospect right. a hang around and then a prospect who's trying to get patched in is there any kind of requirement of a criminal act for them to then get their stripes, get their patch. Again, the way in the mafia, you need to be, right. a, you need to show that you're a good earner right. on the street well, the, illegally, and then maybe even go kill somebody to well, get, become made. The club's yeah, not does, structured like that. Okay. So what would, it's what about, would a member? It, it's focuses around motorcycles and brotherhood. I mean, that's initially, you know, what it was all about. You, you know how the club started, correct? No, or, you guys watched the movie Easy Rider. I no, think, come on. That's a, you know, that's a pretty, that's a pretty good uh, 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 answer. But no, it's not correct. Uh, Dennis Hopper told me how to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, uh, you had returning vets from the Pacific Theater, World War II. from the European Theater mm -hmm. in World War II, and they came back and probably displaced, suffered from undiagnosed PTSD, and... Uh, they started these little bike clubs. You know, you had the booze fighters, uh, you had the galloping goose, mm -hmm. you had the 13 rebels, uh, you had the poo bobs. That was the, you know, pissed off bastards from wherever they were from. Yeah. San and, Bernardino. Yeah. And you know, the hell's angels sprung from that. Right. So that was the birth of the, uh, outlaw bike club and it had nothing to do with, uh, illegal, right. uh, activity, uh, narcotic sales, uh, had to do with, Fraternity. Yeah, it was a fraternity. These guys had this brotherhood. They came back to uh, just about nothing. Yeah. Look, you come back from prison, what's it like? You start over. Yeah. And some guys don't make it. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I don't know, uh, you know, speaking for myself, you know, I've been in prison three times. I've came back three times and uh, reinvented myself and it hasn't been easy you know mm -hmm. each time it's a struggle you know? so do you think your generation adopted this uh ideology of uh, being free and separate from what was then like square middle class sure yeah. norms and, and you know i i think it seems uh, like freedom is the big driver i, I you think guys like it, your freedom absolutely and identity and, and you know the mm -hmm. motorcycle represents uh, uh freedom you know i did a uh interview, uh, which I was totally shocked. Harley Davidson, a motorcycle company, invited me to be part of a uh, documentary back in the mid 80s. And, uh, you know, that was one of the things, you know, the interviewer said, uh, uh, isn't motorcycles a symbol of authority? And, you know, I said, no, it's a symbol of rebellion to right, me. Right. That's, that's what it always meant to me. Right. The first time I saw an outlaw biker was probably in 1955. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I was standing on a street corner with my father, maybe nine, 10 years old. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it just had outlaw all over mm -hmm. him, you know. Yeah. And uh, metaphorically, man, I jumped on that bike, you know, when yeah. that guy went through that signal. And it took me 10 years uh, to get. Uh, into that world, yeah. but uh, I kept thinking about it and wanted to have it. And uh, so, you know, that's what the outlaw movement was right. all about. And I think, you know, so it's based in rebellion. Yeah. You know, and, you know, people confuse the outlaw with the criminal, you know, but there's a lot of people pushed into criminality because of that lifestyle, you right. know, and it, are you going to put food on your table? By any means, or are you going to let your family starve? 
Yeah, well, I think it shouldn't be a big surprise looking back that a club and a culture based off of being an outlaw, which is just by definition criminal, right? If it's outside the law and rebellion, that is going to attract people, even if it's not an explicitly criminal organization, it's going to attract people that make their living through criminality because it's hard to be a lawyer Monday through Friday and then go ride with the brothers well, Saturday, you know, Sunday. You know, we used to call them in the 80s. Weekend warriors? No, we would call them rubs. <laughs> Rich urban bikers. Right. And, uh, you know, uh, yeah. uh, I did I have a problem with the rubs? No, I, you know, it was a big highway. There's lanes going up and there's lanes going right. down and, the, you know, there's plenty of room for everybody. But not everybody can become an outlaw, a okay. real outlaw. So then how, if it's not a criminal organization... And I say this with all due respect. I just, this is what makes for good podcasting. It's my job to. Well, I, I expect you to uh, uh, come after me a little bit. If it's not a criminal organization, then shouldn't, what are the characteristics that you look for in a, a prospect to become a patched in member? If it's not the ability to earn criminally or potentially carry out criminal acts. Well, you know. What kind of guy, motorcycles a guy riding? Is this guy a stand-up dude? Can he hold his mud? I mean, these are '60s uh, expressions, you know. Yeah. And you know, we used to ride up to Bass Lake, and that was the place where you kind of worked out all your differences. And uh, uh, you know, at the end of the weekend, whoever uh, was left standing by the fire is someone we referred to as a regular. You know, yeah. uh, hey, the guy's a regular. Uh, David Ortega, a very close friend of mine, met him in 1966, and, you know, we were friends up until his death. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, good times, sometimes bad times. I mean, we we fought amongst ourselves, not, not to the point where somebody was in jeopardy, but mm-hmm. we had, you know, disagreements and whatnot, like any brother uh, would with his brother. But uh, uh, at the end of that weekend, you know, uh, that was a term he came up with, you know, the guy's a regular, you know. Yeah. What do you think of that guy? Well, he's a regular. You know, we had another guy that came around the club. He was an informant. And I picked him out. I said, I know this guy's no good. And he turned out to be no good. And, uh, you know, I went to David. I always used to defer to David a lot. And I said, you know, I go, David, what do you think of this guy? He goes, I don't know, man. I don't like him. And I said, what do you think it is? And we could never put our finger on it. Mm. And what David came up with, he goes, you know what it is, man? He goes, I just don't like the way he parts his hair. You know, right. and the guy was a rat. You know, he yeah. was working for the FBI. He put, sent Sonny to prison, uh, busted Irish. Irish got murdered before he went to prison. Uh, busted uh, all these guys up in the Bay Area who I'd mentioned earlier, uh, you know, Chico and... Uh, mm. Uh, you know, the rest of that whole, you know, crank crew, those guys were cooking crank mm-hmm. up there. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, you talked about, it, it, is it spread around? No, those guys knew how to cook crank and they wouldn't share that uh, recipe with anybody. <laughs> you know, they were in control. You know, they had that little cartel that they were running. Right. And, uh, uh, you know, and, you know, I had mentioned Jim Jim earlier, like, you know, Jim Jim uh, was ruthless, mm-hmm. you know, and, uh, so, so obviously there's different outfits, different uh, chapters obviously have different levels of criminals in them, right? So an Oakland chapter or a Richmond chapter that's got meth cooks that are making millions of dollars a year, I assume that's going to be a better funded chapter. Am I correct in that? Or well, what are the dues look, that you have to pay the, the, into the, the club? The, the, you know, you pay weekly dues, whatever the, the set uh, dues are. When I first came around the club, it was, you know, five bucks a week. You know, when I left, it was, uh, uh, you know, over $150 a week or whatever. Mm. I mean, cost of living, though, had gone up as well. But, you know, look, the record speaks for itself. You know, you can speculate all day long. These guys are doing this and these guys are doing that. Uh, you know, you talk to Jay Dobbins. Uh, uh, you know, I got no axe to grind with Jay. But, you know, he was an ATF guy. And, you know, it's funny because they talk about us drinking the Kool-Aid. I mean, he drank the Kool-Aid. Mm. You know, he believed that the Hells, and he does believe that the Hells Angels is a criminal organization. You know, and like I say, it's not. It's an organization with criminals in it. And whether good or bad or indifferent, uh, it is what it is. I know? think we might even be splitting hairs. Because, say I have a household, right? Right. Uh, there's 10 people in the household. Okay. It's a big Mexican household. Kidding. 
But it's uh, and only he said that, not me. Yeah, of Everybody. course. <laughs> uh, I'll take the heat. So, household of ten people, only two people in the house are getting abused. Would you call that an abusive household, or would you call it a household that has abusive people in it? It's a household with abusive people in it. <laughs> but, Come on, you knew what I was going to say. <laughs> right, right, right. I feel like I'm the DA right now, and I'm. I'm well, I feel like on I'm on a stand. witness stand, you know. But I, I took six days on the stand, you know. I took the witness stand in my own defense. Yeah, one we're going to talk about that. Okay. We're going to talk about that. So I'm getting ahead of myself. Right? Yeah, okay. so, I usually am. So, are you telling me that there's no that whatever uh, a guy brings in off the street, if he's a member of a chapter? That money isn't getting kicked upstairs to a boss. To it's, a never, it's never been proven, and I don't think it's taking place. Now, if somebody wants to throw some money into the club treasury, right? You know, I don't think anybody's going to question, uh, wait a minute, where's that money coming from? <laughs> oh, no one's going to ask. Right. I mean, I'm being honest. No, I, I you believe know, you. People are not going to ask, but— But you wouldn't have a meth cook toss you an envelope of cash when you were well, the Let me president. tell you something. Like Tony and Soprano. I, I, no. And I, I got this stuff that can substantiate what I'm saying and back up what I'm saying. Tony Tate is an FBI informant. He comes into the meeting and he brings it up in the meeting. He, We've got 12, 13 Hells Angel presidents from the West Coast in there. He comes in there and he goes, I want to blow up the outlaws. I mean, that's a conspiracy. That's a crazy thing to say. Yeah, I would exactly. I and would kick him out. Now, do you have the authority as president to be like, "You're give me your give me your patch. Well, and you're no, done. Like well, you can't you can't no, just do that. you can't you can't do that. But let me tell you what I did do. He's sitting next to me, and aside from having that cavalier statement and you know trying to draw people into the conversation, he has a cast on. Hmm. And. I'm sitting here. He's sitting next to me. The cast is right there. There's a bug in the cast. So they have me on tape saying, hey, you know what? I have no interest in escalating this problem with the, uh, and I'm choosing, and I'll be honest with you. I'm choosing my words very carefully. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking this tape's going to wind up in a courtroom someday. Right. And indeed it did, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, so I confront him basically I go, you're a lucky guy. And he said, what do you mean? I go, you, I go, you get in a bike wreck. You don't even have one bit of road rash on you. Mm. Uh, brand new cast. I go, you're a lucky guy, man. And, uh, you know, he, he leaves the meeting. The FBI breaks the cast off. Then they decide to put the bug in a new device. That's, uh, just kind of late on the scene. And it's called a beeper. You know, this yeah. will give you an idea what, you know, what time frame this is. So they put the bug in the beeper. He goes over to Sonny's house and uh, has the same conversation with Sonny. The problem is Sonny bites and uh, they've got Sonny on tape. You know, he Tate goes, you know, we're going to blow these guys up. This is going to be a problem. There's going to be a lot of collateral damage because I'm going to make this bomb big. And, you know, Sonny says, that, you know, the more people hurt, the better. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so you've got. One conversation, two outcomes. You know? I see. And so what happened to Sonny? Did he, he go down? He went to prison for five years for that conversation. 